Recording is in progress. Greetings, everybody. Um, my name is John Barney, and I'm here with Levi Brown, and we're going to talk to you about improvisation performance. Um, it's going to be focused a lot on spoken word and art and music, but it's a lot of the things that we're going to be talking about today have a lot to do with many of the artists. So, and it's a conversation. Um, it's a conversation that we've been, Levi and I have been engaged in for a few years now, um, and, but also with other people. So, and we hope to engage you in that conversation as well today. Um, you guys all look like, uh, it's like the Hollywood Squares. Remember the same, does anybody remember that? I mean, you guys must remember it. When I say that to my students who are undergrads, they don't know what I'm talking about. But anyway, uh, and this is my first time doing anything like this online. Uh, done classes, done recovery meetings, done a lot of work meetings, but I've never done a reading reading online. So this is awesome. Um, and so thank you, Mary, for the opportunity to continue that conversation further. And I think that's sometimes I think these events are just ways to kind of like catalyze a little more thinking and processing uh, from a creative standpoint to then be able to share, but then also to then carry on another dialogue with all you all out there as part of this process. So I'm, again, we're looking forward to that. I'm going to share a couple slides at the very beginning to kind of explain the, um, let me see. If I can share this. Yeah, okay. Um, and uh, that's speak to the conversation today. So, um, and yes, uh, uh, I don't know if Mary mentioned it, it was, it's at the Thirsty Eyes where the art show is. Um, so it will be up, it looks like for another three weeks, but uh, they, they kept, we, we established the sixth as the, as the official closing date, but uh, the art will be at least for another two weeks. But uh, so there's six pieces there. Uh, there are four by eight. Um, one is a little bit small, actually just seven pieces there. One's a little bit different, it's an installation. So please come by and check it out if you feel comfortable uh, given, given what's going on in the larger environment. So um, so today, a performative conversation uh, with myself and Levi Brown. Um, so a little bit of just background information just because um, yeah, just to, just to frame that conversation and some of the performances today. Um, this is actually a definition of score that comes from well, selections of, of the definition of score coming from Miriam Webster. And the, the point being that it, it, there's a lot of different aspects to score and they seem to overlap. And that's why it was such an interesting word to use to work from as an artist, the markings of an artist, you know, when you're marking the also the notion that what you're doing is a performative act that maybe have certain you know rules and constraints you're using but the act itself also may be you know of creating something much like a, a painting can be a map sometimes it might be a map to a higher consciousness it might be a map to you know transformation of a landscape which is kind of at the heart a little bit of some of the pieces here uh, which have to do with this place called the low line um, it also course has to do with musical composition um, and that's probably where you know, we draw most heavily from. There is a whole um, tradition, I'm, I'm trained as a landscape architect, um, there's a whole notion of scoring landscapes and this comes from a guy named Lawrence Halpern and, and uh, his partner Anna. They, um, Anna is, is a dancer, actually she just passed away a couple of years ago, she outlived him about, about a decade and a half. And probably was really responsible for his thinking more than anything, you know, relating this to landscape. But she was, of course, familiar with scores from choreography and dance. But then marrying those two together with this other sense where these this way of thinking about score is a description, but it, it's a description. It could be prescriptive in the sense like, OK, we create a, you know, a score to create a musical you know, moment, the musical performance, but it can also be descriptive of, of a kind of a moment, in, whether it's in the landscape or it could even be a lot of choreographies are notated after they've been created, right? So in a weird way, it's describing what, what has been a performance that has been created in order to recreate it in the future. So hence, 
hence this sense, and this is a, an evolving definition uh, of that um, for, for, your, for your pleasure this, this evening and for the discourse as we go on. Um, anyway, and then just some terms that you'll, you may hear from time to time, not so much from the performances themselves, but they relate to the performance. And so um, again, um, there's a whole lexicon. This is just kind of a, a loose lexicon that uh, it comes partly, probably mostly from action theater or parts of it too, uh, just the way of thinking about improvisation, but also the way we think about performance. Um, and you know, the word frame, for example, becomes really important uh, in, in terms of creating a improvised performance. It, it's the rules by which you're going to you're going to improvise, and some of those rules are like, well, you only have two minutes, right? You know, that's a that's a rule, that's a frame. Um, others might be, oh, well, this is going to be only movement, you know, no sound. Anyway, there's all different kinds of things. But if you think about it, frame, you know, can be a way to generate anything or a series of frames, you know, improvisational. So, so we'll be working with that one that will kind of be, again, part of the discussion, uh, hopefully at the end. Um, and sort of the other really interesting thing about thinking about all this improvisationally is that the meaning and narrative is no longer, you know, at, is no longer being driven by the creator, right? That's the notion is that really, meaning and narrative is actually created by the audience or by you know, whatever audience that might be, right? And that, that really you're doing the performative act, but the other piece of that is really contingent upon you know, kind of the other the receiver of that communication. And that's really different than at least I learned about art and design. Um, and so it's been really liberating and terrifying at the same time. These are just uh, four concepts. We'll come back to that later. That just, again, just to think about uh, and to play with when we think about improvisation and performance. Um, I'm not gonna say any more on that, but these, it's, these are the four points or four, they're almost, they are sort of dialectics that would come up all, all the time in the conversation between Levi and I in particular, but also between Mary and myself about you know, this, this event this evening. And um, yeah. So, and then the other score, this is because a program is essentially a score, um, is, is kind of what is the various different pieces that we're going to form, uh, concluding with a QA, as which will be obviously most QAs are improvised. This is going to be more consciously so between Levi and myself. And you know, as we respond to any thoughts about you know either those concepts you'd like us to elaborate on them further, or if there are other things that uh, that that you want to respond to or or ask about. So is all that clear? Yeah, I mean, I can't see anybody because they they only have like four little cubes over here on one side. Uh, anyway. So with that, we'll move into actually the making of things. Well, the first piece uh, is called Minnow Take Five. I'm going to drop out of this and um, bring up a different PowerPoint. And so this was actually something that I wrote uh, some years ago uh, when I was very interested in the silvery minnow, which is our one of our Three endangered species in this part of the, of the world, and um, Rio Grande silver you know, and it, it just it it became something that I was very interested in, and um, and so I wrote a fairly essentially an improvised piece that then was then I, then I wrote down, and then I improvised small pieces within it. I've been have performed it at a few different locations, and I and I perform it with this slideshow, which are all images from my from my visual journal, which are, again, it's another form of a, of a score in a sense. Um, and many of you know me from drawing at Chatter, which I would argue that those pieces are both improvised and also a score in a sense, in terms of being a recording of, of the events of that day. So um, and with that, I'm going to try to bring this up.
So this is called Minnow Take 5, a lyric analysis and meditation on climate change. Coming home from La Martini to Coop in the throes of finishing the work for the first iteration of the Minnow Show, I am caught up in a pre-monsoon deluge and have to slow down because I can't see. My windshield wipers on my T1 million don't work. Once the rains began back in June of that year, I didn't want to change them because I thought it was good luck. Bad windshield wipers, more rain. In the moment, I thought about how it always comes back to water and memory here in this place. And as I was thinking about the talk over the last week, I realized that I have no way to really respond to the invisibility and enormity of climate change, even though it all comes back to water and memory too. Part of the invisibility is a scale thing. It's global, a numbers thing, a trending law of the averages statistical thing. But what I've related to in my work is the minnow. It too is fairly invisible and yet very local. The question becomes, how do we make the invisible visible? How do we make that which is enormous local? The minnow story too is all about water and memory. It's a fish that has evolved to live in an arid landscape in the sediment-filled warm shallows. It is invisible like the climate change that affects the landscape it resides in increasing temperatures and more volatile and less predictable weather, and now fracking and the potential impacts to our water system, including the middle Rio Grande of the minnow. The minnow is a survivor. It is the last endemic fish in the middle Rio Grande, still living in the Rio. All the others are gone, extinct, dodo. The geographic description is itself an illustration of the rending of its habitat. Men, mainstream dams, upland changes on the land, diversion of water for irrigation, the constriction of the Rio to a narrow channel and a narrow floodway, urbanization, climate change. The minnow has become our canary in the coal mine. Despite what some farmers down south may say, if there is ever not enough water to sustain the minnow, and at the right times of the year soon, there will not be enough water to sustain us. So who's next? Who's to say we are not next? So the minnow is a proxy for us. By extension, therefore, in a way, the minnow is us. So I learned everything I could about the minnow. It lives in the mainstream of the Rio Grande, but it prefers shallow areas, coves, and embayments, shallow, slow channels, warm, murky water. Spawning depends on a peak flow around the time Snow runoff used to swell the many braided channels that make up the mighty Rio, sometimes from early April to late May, depending on the year. The juvenile minnows then mature in the warmer months, ideally in small ponds, even puddles, and then rejoin the main, st main stem of the river with the larger flows of the monsoon. They hibernate in still water under wood detritus, rocks at the river's edge, allozyme differences, a two loci differentiated from the Plains minnow and the Mississippi silvery minnow. It has a small overbite. In my work, the minnow is the minnow known as the Rio Grande silvery minnow, Ibognathus amarus, and all the concerns and processes that shape its survival in the face of annihilation. The genetic memory of an entire riparian landscape through eons lives on in its DNA. A shallow estuary in the age of the dinosaurs flowing into a series of wetlands knitted together by a sometimes flooded river in a rifting valley, one of three in the world, into the green and gold agricultural landscape of pueblos and land grants, into drained, levied, and jetty jacked river, witness to the coming of the railroad, Route 66, to the development of the world's first atomic weapons, and DOS in Mr. Gates' first garage. Perhaps the primary reason for conservation of endangered species is the preservation of genes and these precious histories with the mutations and evolutions they contain. The minnow is a survivor. It has much to teach us about the place we live in and ourselves. As a survivor, the minnow in the work also becomes a metaphor for survival and overcoming. Refugees and Holocaust survivors, immigrants seeking a path to citizenship, gay couples obtaining the right to get married, families grieving the loss of a loved one in the service of our country, protesters on the outskirts of Chaco 
my daughter going through her rites of passage, graduation, leaving home, my own survival of prostate cancer. In this way, the minnow becomes visible in everyday life as I identify myself and others with it. Us, survivors, like the minnow. One understanding of Native American stories is that we, we as listeners are meant to identify with certain totemic animals in the stories and apply the moral of that animal story and its symbolic value in our own lives. In other words, we may embody the minnow. Another very real outcome of this process is what David Abram refers to as living in story relation and reciprocity with other organisms, with the world at large, including our changing climate. This is a different relationship than the one based on dominance or even stewardship. This is the minnow now for us here and for me here. The minnow is not only alive, but lives in a conscious awareness. It is both within and outside time. The minnow is visible every day. Perhaps the minnow is telling not only its story, but our story in this place. At this point, the minnow's survival is woven in with ours and the water operations that underpin the riparian landscape it resides in. Pochichi Dam and Elephant Butte Lake define the edges of the minnow's home. Like the river itself, the minnow's existence is increasingly part artificial and part natural. In the blue tubs of the refugium in the Albuquerque Biopark, thousands of minnows are hatched every year and then released. Slow release of the winter snow melt stored behind Pochichi Dam keeps the river flowing in much of the reach throughout the year this way. The minnow is like us, and we are like the minnow in our increasingly bored life lives, especially now. And yet we can always go outside, leave the phone, and re-engage the senses in our home more fully in the cycles that frame life in this place. Understanding those local cycles, so important to the minnow, and seeing the small changes annually and over time, for me, is the only way to access and understand changes in larger cycles. When the temperatures here and north of here result in snow melt, when the cotton lets go, when the rains come, when the temperature goes down and the leaves begin to change, when things go into hibernation, when the snow comes, if it comes at lower elevations. This year was so much more, there was so much more rain early in the season and there were huge peak flows in May and June and the cottonwoods held onto their cotton until late. And this was the year that I wrote this. And yet so much of the minnow cycle is affected by the decisions of the Corps of Engineers through the timing and the amount of water released from Cochiti Dam, which can result in a peak flow of 3,000 CFS or ideally 5,000 CFS flooding side channels, embayments created by the Corps throughout this reach. This decision in turn is dictated by the amount of snow melt. There is a delay, some years no response at all. The natural cycle is still present, albeit muted. The early rains this year made for a large peak flow. There was much spawning. So my question, or perhaps more properly my quest, is how do we celebrate the minnow and the Arabahoy, connect more deeply into the natural rhythms of this place, and bring the minnow more consciously into our collective awareness, and through that, the animate world at large here, including our idiosyncratic client, which is changing. Making art minnows, making poetry, making Spoken word pieces has been my initial response. The body of minnow work was hatched in some conversations with my dear friend Rick Billings, who passed away three years ago. He was a little fish guy that focused on how to save and restore the minnow sanctuary off of Second Street in the South Valley. The work initially took the form as entries in my visual journals. The work wanted to be about something bigger than me, but also be woven through the fabric of my own life. And so the journal pages grew and I grew and I shared what I had found in one-on-one -on -one conversations over my journal into shows. This has been an experiment for me working this way, evolving an insight, a vision, and a journal into a more comprehensive or complicated, larger conceived work. But I am wondering, what about a shift in scale? How do we celebrate the places where the minnows like to live, make them visible? How do we make the peak flow visible? Could we have a celebration of the arrival of the peak flow and the letting go of all those minnow eggs every year in mid-April or May. Maybe it could be the spring counterpart to all our fall harvest festivals. Maybe we could call it the running of the minnows. And what about the rights of the minnow as such just to be like us, the minnows like liberty and pursuit of happiness 
work continues clearly. All I know is that I am committed to survival and thriving in the minnow. I have become apprentice to the minnow. This is my access point for a conversation on climate change and personal change. I recognize that my life, my happiness in this place is linked to that of the minnows. My intention is that through experiencing the work and its evolution, we begin to become connected to the minnow too, and thereby fall in love outward. And in David Abrams' words, deepen your compassion for the land here, the water here, the climate here, the creatures here, and then dedicate yourself to the terrain that has claimed you. Meet the generosity of the land, the kind of wild faithfulness. So thank you for your attention to the minnow and to this presentation. And by the way, I changed my windshield wipers in the middle of the rains this year in July. And that's that. And I would like to now, it says here, I'd like to close the poem, but instead of closing the poem, this poem then evolved further into an improv improvisational piece that is uh, a work that was created with Lisa Donald, who is a, a cellist virtuoso here. And so I'm gonna stop sharing so that Mary can share that. Um, in this case, the, the score in, that you will be for, the, for this particular musical piece was that started with the poem, but then changed from there. Um, and of course, all of the music, musical part is improvised. And with that, with Mary. This is called Minnow Take One. You're muted, Mary. It's the endless question of words, of minnows in the Rio, of work, relationships, life, suffering, mine, yours, fill up glasses. The lone migrant worker, a solitary minnow among the throng, a lone cello at the end of this song, going home to her wife and children, nothing more. Sunday morning, shaky and holding small coffee, picked and roasted by hands elsewhere. Sal, the poet, giddy up, gets up to share his poetry, a solitary minnow on stage, unmediated, direct, loving, unloving, lived. The suffering, the minnow suffering, our suffering, clear, unpremeditated, Searching for the seven cities of gold, hoping to find God now almost three hundred. 
200 million minnows strong, 800,000 of us living here, minnows working under the sun. 300 days of the year, 12 million minnows among us seek their rights in D.C. 4,000 new minnows at the refugium this year. 24 minnows get married on the plaza. Amen to that. And now 12 minnows. Just 12 minnows caught in sampling nets, some still pregnant, but that's all there is. Six minnows on a wall that I say is art. One minnow now, back from the Peace Corps. Six minnows who work with me, trying to make the world a better place. And two minnows holding each other all night. And one minnow. up again this morning, opening once again today to all this rising and falling to the sound of the gavel and trump, to the rush of cars and bats returning to their stuff, to snow melting on the polar ice cap, to the gurgle and laugh of Rio and coyotes, yodel. Yes, to all this rising and falling, it is us. Thank you. Uh, so some moving hands. I guess that's it counts for employees. So um, I think uh, the next piece is actually going to be is a recording of the low line, which is a another piece uh, that was done with musicians. Uh, again, which was largely improvised, including the text over time, and came kind of became a kind of set piece. Um, and I'm just getting a little uh, direction here on the side. And I think we're, but we're gonna save that piece to the very end, just to kind of unwind after all this. And we're gonna move into one of the improvised pieces right now with Levi in a, in, so we can actually engage some more of the live aspects to this. Um, and this piece is called Emoji in a Bottle. Hot, hot, hot. I would send this message to you if I were a radio telescope. But what about love? Love. Love. I feel pretty, so very pretty, even if I were a radio telescope, I would send this message to you. Uh, If I were a telescope and my grandparents do not approve and my father and mother do not approve, but, 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 even if our shadows are long, I would send 
this message to you. Heart, heart, heart. Even if I am not sure I want you. Uh, even if I am not sure that my mother and father approve, but, but even if I were a pretty telescope and my grandparents do not approve and the party does not approve, Heart. Heart. Even if I love you like a drop of rain, even if you're not sure you want me and our shadows do not approve. Heart. Heart. I am a radio telescope. I feel pretty, so very pretty. But what about love? Love. If I were a radio telescope and you were an alien, I would send this message to you. Heart. 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 So, and now we will do short poem, Dear COVID-19. Dear COVID-19, where have you been all my life? You are so very dramatic. Is that always necessary? Even if I find it compelling, which I do, your numbers are too much for me, and you won't tell me straight away if you are coming or going, let alone say I do. But I like the conversation you provoke in me about my life and death. Why do you try to take my breath away every chance you get when I walk on by? Even if you don't want to have my life, even if your heart pain is asymptomatic, Oh, COVID, why won't you love me the way I want to be loved? This next piece is called Bay's Garden. And it has a frame for it that's in this sketchbook here, which I can really show. It was based on a poem, and Levi's already started it.
So it's one of those beautiful fall evenings that we had so many of this year that in New Mexico where it's the sky is that blue, that beautiful, pure blue, crisp, it's cool, dry, the sun is going down and light of the late afternoon is upon us. And I am done with work for the day. I'm in my car and I'm just I'm moving out of my workspace, mind space, and I am driving to the foothills or to the bosque where, you know, where we could find that to this place. But I get a call from my friend, Faye. My friend, Faye, he says, John, you won't believe what has happened. Jack's got one of the birds from outside and dragged it inside the house and there are feathers everywhere. There are feathers in the bedroom. There are feathers in the kitchen. There are feathers in the dining room, the living room, in my office. And it is bleeding from a spot. And I'm like, hey, why don't you put it out of its misery? She says, no, I can't put it out of my misery. I can't even, I'm in misery right now. I am moving. I'm in the middle of a pandemic and I am quarantined. I can't do any of the things that I'm used to do. I can't deal with any more grief. Will you come over and do something about it? And so I look up. How? Kill the bird. What if I don't want to kill the bird? What if I'm deaf and I don't want to do the thing I am trained to do? What if I don't want to be the killing machine that I'm always having to be 24 seven? What if I could just be a bureaucrat for a day or a week or at least a work week or maybe a whole year or maybe a whole lifetime or a whole eternity where I just have to kind of check a few boxes. There's a few boxes for the morning, few deaths in the morning, and a, and a few deaths at night, or maybe that's the afternoon, maybe, no, no death at night, no more deaths at night. No, I get to go home. What if death just wants a life partner? Yeah, what if we could just, you know, I could have, we could just, you know, be partners, me and life, and we could just, we could hang together, and we could just go into the garden and sit, or maybe we would plant a few things side by side, and it wouldn't be a test. Maybe we could just do things that we love to do. Maybe we could do a little thing here in the kitchen and make some thing here and go down the hall to the bedroom and do another thing down there we can do all these things together together we could sit in the garden together we could watch the birds the sun going down and the blue sky changing to Indigo, birds, bird, bird. And then the cat came back. 
And that was that. So that was, uh, again, a piece that was derived from a, a poem that was actually, we even, the poem was actually lost at a certain point altogether, but that provided the initial set of frames. Um, and then the entire piece is improvised, it's different every single time at this point, other than the six frames that we moved through. Um, like to do, shall we play the low line? Do we have time for that, Mary, December? Or shall we? Uh, or shall we try the, the, the COVID photo stick? Um, how much time do you think doing both of them would be? Um, I think the, it'll be about four minutes for the, the, uh, the low line. I think that that's about how long that performance runs. So that's pretty much, that'll take us to 620 if that's our frame from a time standpoint. Well, we'll just won't be able to have much Q and A. Uh, so uh, let's do the low line, and then if we have time, how long is the photo stick? As long as we want to make it, we should probably do that first if we're going to do that. Okay. All right. So go ahead then, and 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 do that. But if if you can keep that one kind of short, and then if you want to do the low line, and then we'll have just a, a few minutes for Q and A. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Levi, are you ready for this? I am. So just quick, this is an improvisation between photos that John has taken during the time of COVID. Maybe you want to say something about that, but improvisation between those and music. So I'll be improvising based on his photos and he's going to be responding to me with the, with new choices of photos. So it's a back and forth between music and images.
Wow, that was great for <laughs> an amazing. We've never done that before. So that was completely, that was the first time we've ever improvised that. <laughs> You're amazing. Bye. So, um, so appreciate being able to work with Levi and have these conversations and, and just be able to play. And um, also Minnie Grossberg, who's not on this evening, but she was my action theater coach, taught me a lot about improvisation as well. So, um, and of course, Charlotte and Lisa, who are part of, who with Levi and myself are part of the Moving Lines Ensemble. And I guess we should just end with that, huh, Mary? And then we can go into the q Yes, okay, so we're gonna do the low line. Uh, and so you'll have to screen, you're gonna screen share again, right? That's correct. Okay, cool. All right, tell me when to start it, okay? Okay. So this is called the low line. As many of you may know, New York City has the high line. Well, some students of mine some years ago named the railroad spur that goes behind us from the main line all the way to the sawmill. They named it the low line.
How my voice is the sound of a herd of buffalo coming Thank you, everybody, for your attention this evening. We stand for questions, as we have, as I have to say at my day job. I stand for questions, commissioners. Okay, I'm going to stop recording, and then, John, do you want to? Um...